Hello. Today, I'm going to demonstrate the procedure for cutting conventional TEM half grids into posts suitable for atom probe tomography. The application for this procedure would be to make samples that can go into either the TEM and then the atom probe, or samples that need to be analyzed using some kind of a transmission technique such as TKD imaging and then atom probe tomography uh, or uh, other applications that require the sample to be mounted onto a copper grid or a TEM grid instead of the conventional silicon micropost arrays. To do this procedure, first you need to have some TEM half grids. Now, almost any material will work for this, but the conventional uh, easy to find grids are made of copper. Here I have two grids sitting on a Kim wipe, and we'll go ahead and load these into our suitable TEM grid holder. Let's try that again. Probably open the gap up just a little bit more. Okay, there's one. Now, if you're going to do this procedure a lot, or especially if you're gonna do this on the PFIB, like I'm demonstrating, you should note that the TEM grid holder will get com extremely contaminated with the grid material, in this case, copper. And hopefully it shows up in the camera, but there is a considerable amount of copper uh, residue all around this holder position from uh, all the fib cutting on the copper. So. If you have a TEM grid holder that you wanna keep nice, I would recommend you don't use it for this procedure. All right, so we have our grids in our normal uh, TEM holder, and let's go ahead and put those into the microscope. So this is a Helios Gener G4 PFIB. Um, we're just going to go ahead and choose the other accessory for our sample holder right now. And we'll go ahead and hit click vent and we'll vent the system. And I'm going to pause the recording so you don't have to wait for the venting time and the loading time. So we'll resume with the sample already in the chamber. All right, so chamber's pumped down now. And let's go ahead and we're just going to turn on both of our beams when we wake up. And our SEM conditions aren't real critical for this application. Uh, we're mainly using the SEM just to find the TEM grid. So uh, 5 kV is fine, um, but anything you want, 10 kV, 2 kV, whatever. So let's use our nav cam. We can zoom in here and we'll go find the grid fingers. Now this particular grid I'm using is made by Ted Pella. It has four fingers on it. So one, two, three, four. I would recommend that you do not sharpen adjacent grid fingers. They are too close together. When you run these in the atom probe, you're likely to blow up the neighboring posts. Um, and in fact, the safest thing I think is to actually just sharpen the outside two uh, fingers on each grid. So each grid will have two posts. Uh, I've got two grids in here. That would be four posts total. So let's go ahead and just zoom in. We're going to focus and link our working distance on the top of the grid finger like we would always do. And we'll bring this up to four millimeters working distance. All right. And then let's do an XT align or align feature command. We're going to make the grid horizontal. Uh, 
Uh, let's try that one more time. I don't think we got perfect there. Having a perfectly aligned grid for this isn't real critical because we're going to make a post. Uh, so it's, it's symmetrical. It doesn't really matter. Uh, all right, so let's now turn on, uh, let's go ahead and tilt to 52 degrees because we're going to do all our work with the fib at a 52 degree angle. Um, you can see here my, it looks like my grid fingers are a little bit on an angle to the right. That's not a real big deal. We're going to cut these things into a, into a straight pillar, uh, no matter what that angle happens to be. So not a big problem. And I'm just going to use kind of a medium beam current here just to focus and make sure the alignment of the grid finger is correct by FIB. Uh, let's see here. FIB. So I'm just going to zero my beam shift, uh, put that top of the grid right in the center of the FIB image, and check that my SCM is also looking at the top of the grid. That should be fine. And let's go ahead and we're going to just save this stage position and say end. And then let's go find the other uh, grid fingers. So we've got the one on this far right here. Okay. Click add. And then we'll go find the samples on the other TEM grid. So I must have been in a hurry and got that one grid in kind of sideways. So we'll say add. And add. Now, I'm just going to, for convention's sake here, I'm going to call the grid uh, finger that I'm on right now. Let's call this one position number, or grid finger number one. So we'll just say this is finger one. And we'll go with, this one will be finger two. Finger three. Finger four. Yeah, space there. Okay. Right. So first step of the procedure is we're going to do a coarse um, cut to try to shape this thing into a rough post. Uh, I'm going to do this cut at a 0 0.50 microamp beam current. And when you image with this beam current, you are going to, um, well, if I had my working distance link correctly, the shutter would go in. Let me redo that. There we go. So there goes the retractable shutter will go in to protect the uh, SEM column from the sputtered uh, material off of the grid. Now what we want to do is try to get our focus um, as reasonable as we can. Um, these big beams are kind of hard to focus and they hopefully your system or if you come to use our PFID, they'll be a little better alignment on the day you use it, but um, this is all we're looking for, just kind of rough focus um, of the system. Now, we want to draw a pattern on top of here that will leave a circle behind in the center. So we would do a circle in the middle. And then what I usually do is a polygon pattern. And I try to just create kind of a rough outline of the sample post um, this way you're not wasting a lot of time cutting on um, you know the extra material that makes it a little more time efficient so 
I would usually make some kind of a goofy kind of mushroom shape like this with the polygon tool. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Just kind of something like this. Uh, all right, so good enough. And then we want to change the circle pattern in the center to be an exclusion zone. So we're gonna select the circle and we're gonna choose this little drop down menu here and we're gonna say exclusion zone enable. And that will keep the fib from cutting in the center uh, region there. So that'll leave behind the post and it'll cut away the rest of the material. Now, um, when I do this in practice, I usually don't draw the pattern every time. I usually just import uh, the pattern from a saved file. So to do that, I would go file, import pattern, and I have my patterns for this operation here. I got, it's gonna be three steps. First step is my 0.5 microamp pattern here. And you can see it's pretty much the same thing I just drew. Um, the difference is that I have programmed in the exact dimension. So my circle is a 20 micron diameter circle. And the depth of the cut for the other pattern is 20 microns deep using the silicon application file. So I, I put that pattern on the screen. I'm gonna say select all so I get both patterns. And I'm just gonna move this around and get it right on top of the TEM grid finger. Now, sometimes these fingers vary in shape a little bit. Um, if that's the case, even if you're using the imported pattern, just go ahead and, and you can adjust the pattern points a little bit. Um, that way you won't leave behind any uh, little bits of copper or spikes or anything like that. Um, those can be kind of annoying to deal with. So this should be plenty good. And then we're going to hit play. And if you see over here, the total time expected is 4 minutes and 38 seconds for this operation. So um, let's just to see what's happening here. We got our, here's our SEM image. Uh, all right, so there's our starting point. Let's hit play. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and we'll start it back up in four minutes and 20 seconds when this is just about done and we can see what happens. Okay, so our pattern just finished. Let's take a look at the result. All right, pretty good. So we can see here we've got, we've turned our um, copper TEM grid finger into something more like a post, but it's still kind of a rough shape. Um, the top's not flat. It's got way, it's way too wide in diameter. So now um, when I would be doing this if for real, what I would do is then move over to the next finger by going to my save stage position. And I would just do all the cuts at the at this 0.5 microamp beam, and then I'll come back to the first post and do my cleanup cuts. Um, the other thing I want to demonstrate is while you're still at the 0.5 microamp beam, is I like to put a notch, or some kind of a unique notch or feature into one of the copper grid fingers that I'm not going to use, and this helps you differentiate the posts when you're in the atom probe. Uh, the atom probe can only see the profile of the grid. So all these posts will look the same and you can't tell if you have the grid one way or the other. Um, so if you cut a mark onto one of these posts, you make the whole grid kind of asymmetric. And then when you're in the atom probe, you can tell which posts you're, you're looking at. So what I like to do is uh, for this grid is I'm gonna go to the second finger here and I'm just gonna simply put a rectangle pattern right down the middle of the grid and cut it about 10 microns deep. It doesn't have to be very deep. Uh, you'll see it in the, in the atom probe, no problem. And we'll cut this. Now let's take a look at what we have now. Now 
And you see now I've got this, uh, this notch in the second grid finger. So this way I can tell which posts are which because I'm not going to put a notch in, in this one. Uh, so we would have the sharp post is number one, and then that one would be next to my marker post. And then the post over here that's next to a regular post would be, be post number two. And then on my second grid, if I go over to finger three, um, on this grid, what I would do is instead of doing a single rectangle cut, um, I would put one here, copy it, maybe put a second one. So something like, like this. And then that way there'll be two, two um, trenches cut into this finger. So I'll have grid number one, grid number two, and those will be easily identifiable by the number of notches in the post. Um, and you'll be able to see that in the TEM, you'll be able to see that in the Atom Probe, and you'll be able to know which, which grid fingers you're looking at. Um, and you could do any variation on this theme that you want. Just put some kind of mark in here that you can see in the profile view of the grid that makes it asymmetric. Um, now in the SEM, uh, this isn't so hard because you can see the reference number in the grid, this four that's down here. But this, you won't be able to see this in the Atom Probe. Uh, you might be able to see that in the TEM as well. But, but keep in mind that the Atom Probe holders generally obscure that. So you need to make some kind of mark up here on the top so that you'll be able to see it. All right, so let's go back to finger number one because uh, this is just a, a demonstration type thing. So we did our 0 0.50 microamp cut with the 20 micron circle pattern and the 20 micron depth. The second cut we're gonna do is we're gonna drop our beam current to 60 nanoamps. And let's keep, make sure our focus is reasonable. It should be pretty close. Uh, okay, good enough. You wanna focus on the top of the post as, if possible. And we're gonna go ahead and import our second pattern here. So I got my copper grid second cut, which this is just simply a, a donut pattern. So it's just a basic circle uh, with the center circle uh, area. So it's a 25 micron outer diameter and a five micron inner diameter and 10 micron depth using the silicon application file. So just put that um, on the top of the post as best you can and we'll go ahead and run it. And you see this is a three minute and 10 second pattern. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording until this is nearly done so that you don't have to wait for three minutes of nothing. Okay, so the pattern's done. Now let's see what the result looks like. And now we have a much more refined shape here on our post. Uh, now the last thing we need to do is we're going to, eventually we're gonna be lifting out a sample and setting it on the top of this post. And if you cut the post using the steps I'm showing you, you're likely gonna end up with a fairly sharp spike at the top. Um, that's not easy to attach anything to. So what we wanna do is to chop this off so it's got a flat top on it. And that makes it behave like the conventional flat top silicon post that you can buy from, from Kamika. So to do that, let's turn our beam current down. I'm gonna go down to one nanoamp. And we want to make the sample as perpendicular to the fib as we can. So on most tools, uh, that would be going to the minus 10 degree stage tilt. So we can go, I can show you how that looks. So the fib will still be at a 28 degree angle to the post. Uh, so you won't be able to cut it off completely flat at this angle. Uh, okay, so, so now we have our fib image and we could go ahead and focus and then we would use a pattern to uh, chop this off at whatever value that we wanted to. Now on our Helios PFib, we can actually go to a, a more negative tilt than this. Um, we can go all the way to minus 38 degrees. In order to do that, you have to open up the sample exchange window and you have to tell the system you're using the spin mill holder. Otherwise the software will not allow you to go to the minus 38 tilt. So 
I'm going to say we're choose a spin mill holder. Now, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is you have to have your sample in the center of the stage. So um, I'm using a single stub holder and I have everything right here in the middle. Um, if you're using one of the cross holders and your TEM grids are out on the outside uh, arms of the holder, like way out here, the software is not going to let you go to minus 38 tilt. So now we can choose minus 38 and we can back tilt the stage to make the sample um, perpendicular to the fib. Now, there is a really, really, really important safety concern here. Um, for some reason, when Thermo Fisher wrote this software, they didn't think about the fact that um, the, the fib image, if you double click in the fib image, the stage tries to move really, really fast, either away from the uh, fib or towards the fib. And you got to be really careful on this. So if you're looking at your fib image like this, um, keep in mind that the axes haven't moved around. So like if I double click on the end of the post right now, I'm going to cause the microscope to slam my sample holder into the fib column because uh, the software interprets a double click down here as um, trying to move in the Y direction, but it does a tilt correction on it. So it basically tries to move it in uh, it's like a divide by zero error. So it, it tries to move it an infinite amount of distance uh, towards the column. So don't double click on the fib image when you're at the minus 38 or 37 degree tilt. You're likely going to screw everything up. Um, to show you the, the extent of this problem, if I, I'm going to save my position here as position one. And if I click, um, let me just double check here. If I click, if I, yeah, if I move it up, um, one, it moved it way out of focus, but if I double click, uh, watch what happens here. So just a simple double click moves the sample, uh, looks like about 30 millimeters or so. And you can, uh, you can imagine that if I had double clicked uh, on the lower half of the image, that would have driven the sample directly into the FIB column. So just keep this in mind, uh, big, 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 big safety risk here. Now, if I need to move that tip from where it is to the center of the image, keep in mind this z-axis is the height control. So I would use the stage z, and I would lower, raise or lower the sample, and that will cause the sample to move the way that you're expecting it to, so that you can look at the end of the tip. The SEM image motion will be normal. So on the SEM image, go ahead and double click to move to whatever you need, but just be careful about the fib image. Don't double click. Um, when you're looking at it like this, because more than likely you're going to crash. All right, so we get our focus uh, set up here. Um, we got this sort of shadowy thing going on. That's when you're scanning really fast. You'll see that. Um, not really important, but that's that's what you're seeing here. And then my third pattern, I'm going to go ahead and import my pattern, uh, pattern uh, third cut here at one nanoamp. And this pattern, uh, where is it? Here it is. This is just a simple rectangle pattern, nothing special. Um, I have the X dimension. I normally like to aim for somewhere between two and three microns. Uh, so here, let's just set it to be two microns. You see the Z value is like one micron um, down. I'm gonna beam shift here a little bit. Beam shifts are okay. And I'm just going to put that right on the side of this post and hit play. And you see this is going to take about, you know, 45 seconds or so a minute. But I don't even think we need to let the pattern run to completion here. I think the copper will be cut away uh, before, before that timer runs out. Okay. So now uh, what I usually do just to get a little bit nicer shape on the top of this post is I usually do one more cut. Um, just kind of a little bit smaller here and let it run a little bit longer. So my pattern is 2.5 microns right now. So that means the top diameter of this post should be uh, 2.5 microns. The, the silicon posts that you buy from Kamika uh, usually have a two micron circle on the top. So this is actually a little bit uh, bigger than 
the Kamiko posts, but this is this is perfectly suitable now to set your lift out chunk on top of there and attach it with the the welds, you know, platinum or tungsten or whatever you use to weld the sample to the top, and then you can go ahead and sharpen it with your conventional recipe. So um, that's basically the procedure. Uh, so we got three milling cuts. Again, we got the 0 0.5 microamp cut to do the rough shaping of the post, then a 60 nanoamp cut to make it into the nice kind of conical post shape, and then a one nanoamp cut uh, from an angle on the side to chop off the top and give it kind of a flat top to set on. And on the PFIB, uh, on our PFIB, we can do that at minus 38 degree tilt, um, or you can do it at minus 10 degree tilt. And just keep in mind, you'll have just a little bit of an angle on that top, but I've never found that that causes any real problems. Um, it looks a little odd when you're looking at the side view of the weld because the top's not flat, but um, it should work out okay. Be careful once you take these out of the system. Um, it's really easy to bend these posts because they really don't have any mechanical support. They will be protected a little bit from these neighboring, the wing on the side here and this neighboring post, but uh, try to be careful with these, uh, especially once they're sharpened into an atom probe tip, you know, don't drop the grid on the table. Um, and certainly don't let this run into anything. Uh, loading into the TEM holder, that can be a little bit tricky, um, but just you know, do your best not to, uh, to wreck the tips once they're sharp. And then uh, the TEM grids, this has to go into a TEM grid holder that can fit in the atom probe. So the diameter of the pin on these uh, fib holders will not fit into the atom probe. So you're gonna have to either buy or make your own holder that can go into the leap pucks. Um, if you're working in our lab here, I have, there's a couple uh, styles that we have available that'll fit in the leap. So just come talk to me and I'll, I'll help you out uh, to do that. Um, otherwise, it's a pretty simple matter. Just take a cheap Ted Pella TEM grid holder and grind down the diameter of the pin on the bottom so that it'll fit into the copper puck on the, uh, on the leap. Uh, it doesn't take too long. You can do it with a file. You could do it with, I guess, sandpaper, but... Um, you could do it on a lathe if you wanted to be really exact, but it's it's not too not too difficult to do. Uh, all right, so that's the whole procedure. Uh, it's about 10, 11 minutes per per post, which um, is, is pretty fast on the PFIB. You can do this on the Helio 650, but keep in mind because the max beam current is 65 nanoamps, it means it's going to take you about 10 times longer to do that first cut. So you're looking at about 40 to 45 minutes to cut each of these posts instead of like 10 minutes for each post. Uh, so it's a little bit more expensive, a little bit um, more time involved there. All right, so uh, please contact me at uh, Michigan Center for Materials Characterization if you have any questions, um, and thanks for watching.